Hello, Jordan. What's up, Michael? Bro, dessert in moderation is the best vice. Wow, I didn't expect you to say that. I thought you were going to go the other way. No. Of all the, like, if you think of the spectrum of sex addiction, alcoholism, like whatever the classic vices are, and you, and you pair your way all the way back down to something that's enjoyable, but also not nearly as, if at all, detrimental to your physiology or psychology, even beneficial to your psychology, dessert and moderation is where it's at. I 100% would have expected you to say exercise is the best vice. I don't think it's a vice. Okay. Because it's pain. Mm. Remember, like if you think of immediate, there's two ways to get pleasure, like mm -hmm. cheap, immediate, artificial, mm -hmm. porn, mm -hmm. sugar, et cetera. And then there's cold bath, jumping out of an airplane, doing a, running a marathon, doing these things that give you pain, but then you get delayed pleasure from it. Mm. Yep, yep, yep. Got it. Got it. Okay, nice. What What's your dessert as of late? You're so good at asking the questions. Uh, some chocolate chip cookies, I think. That was probably the most recent. Like homemade chocolate chip cookies or like the Pillsbury Doughboy? No, nah, homemade. Did your wife make them? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. My daughter's been doing that lately. We'll wake up like, hey, what do you want for breakfast? Cookie. And then she'll like <laughs> do like the cookie monster, like cookie. <laughs> She's got it. Yeah, no, not not for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, but she knows she knows what's up. She's <laughs> she knows. She's like, this is a good vice. This is a good yeah, vice. Yeah, just give me one, just one, just one cookie. It's the perfect vice for breakfast <laughs> in moderation. <laughs> the willpower instinct. How are you enjoying it, Jordan? And I started a book. Yeah, Mike told me he's like, hey, you gotta read this book. And so, and how often do I tell you, Hey, you have to read a book. It used to be more often in 2017, 2018, 2019, and now it's maybe once a year. Okay. So once a year over the last five years, because I, within one chapter, I saw threads of previous versions of you and I in the book mm. that I have for sure lost. I don't know where you're at, but I know I've lost and- I thought we would benefit from picking up some of those ideas that uh, that benefited us in the past. Willpower is always something that no matter who you are, where you're from, what your goals are, how old you are, how young you are, it doesn't matter. Like it's always worth exploring how to improve your willpower. It's it's like the it's actually really cool. The first chapter, I, I'm I'm still in the middle of the. So we got through the introduction. I'm like halfway through the first chapter. For all the, the OG listeners, this is not going to be like outlive Peter Atia. We're going to read this whole book. Um, but uh, it was the evolutionary aspect of willpower, why we needed to or why we developed it from an evolutionary perspective actually made a lot of sense. And I know it's a theory, but it does make a lot of sense. And it was at the very least enjoyable to to consume that part of the of the book thus far. Yeah. And and the reminder that willpower is a muscle like your biceps or your triceps and that you can actually increase the amount of willpower you have by training it similar to a muscle. Like physiologically increasing the amount of gray matter in the prefrontal cortex of your brain. Um and I'm so I I started it before you, obviously, but in chapter two, he starts or she starts talking about exercise. It's a female author, male narrator of the audiobook, but uh, she starts talking about exercise. There's a little bit on meditation, all of these things that have worked in the past for me at improving willpower. It's like, why, why do I forget these things that I know work so well? I know this is a complete aside. And we'll go back to it, but I I wish that she did the audio. Like I don't like it when authors use someone else to do the audio. I'd rather hear it directly from the author. I didn't even realize that it was a female author, just because it's a male reader. I didn't even know yeah. that. I you know I feel like you develop a closer relationship with the author when it's actually them doing it. I I can see that perspective. You don't mind either way. I'd prefer having a good reader, especially because most authors. 
look, if I followed her on social media and was a fan of her and then she yeah, wrote yeah, a book, yeah. I think I would have, similar to like Gary or even our book, um, mm -hmm. doing audiobooks, that makes sense. But when I'm only there for the ideas and not the individual, it doesn't bother me. You know, it's it's immediately created more empathy too because in this first couple of chapters talking about She's wow. Well, she is explaining. <laughs> I was just going to say he because it's the guy reading it, but she's explaining how in her course that just completely warped my brain. I didn't realize it was a female author. So this whole time imagining a dude giving because this is based on her course. I think at Stanford, like her 10 week course. Mm -hmm. So but she's explaining how um, in this course, like all the most common issues people struggle with in terms of willpower whether it's drugs whether it's money whether it's sex whether it's like and, and it's funny because as she's going through this list i'm like oh i don't struggle with that i don't struggle with that i don't oh i i do struggle with that so it does like it give you it gives you more empathy and understanding of oh wow so if you struggle with this at a high level but you don't struggle with these it can give you more empathy to understand. So the the urges that you struggle with in this are exactly how other people feel in relation to other willpower related uh, issues. It, it's very interesting. And, and it gave me more like, for example, I don't struggle with um, spending money, like the urge to spend money mm -hmm. is so foreign to me. Because my fear of losing money and losing everything essentially prevents me from doing that. It's just like, I, and I guess I don't really need things very much. So like the idea of like, I know there are people who struggle so much with spending money. Like as soon as they get it, Oh, I got to spend it. I got to spend it. And I can now have more empathy for, under, Oh wow. Like I can relate my urges and what I struggle with to what they're struggling with, even though I don't go through what they go through. It's a really good point. Yeah. Oh, the, the two U's was awesome too. The, in any situation, there's there's two parts of you that are essentially both you, mm. and one wants what's best for you, and the other one wants – we could just call it one is good and one is bad. Like one wants the quote-unquote good thing and one wants the quote-unquote bad thing. And uh, by improving your willpower, you're going to increase your frequency of acting in alignment with – the the you that is the good version rather mm. than the the one that's giving in to the temptation the one did who's... she say did she say in the book though like don't call it the bad one I thought that I she don't... said don't call Ma it the bad Ma one I, maybe I, I think she that's why she said we it. should name it yeah I think she said like na give it a name because like that calling it the bad one leads to uh worse outcomes like that shaming that guilting when you, when it's like this is the bad one this is the good one when it's right it's both you but you give it a name i think i i forget i forget exactly how she phrased it but i did think that was really interesting and it did bring it back to as a coach you know good foods bad foods da, 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 like it good bait you know what i mean i it's interesting because for a lot of people will and i could relate to the food aspect and some of the food examples that she gives. Mm. I don't like thinking of good and bad in terms of food, just because I genuinely don't believe that the quote unquote bad choice, the less mm. nutritionally dense choice is actually bad. Mm -hmm. So I almost like given my experience with nutrition, set that in a separate category because for so many other temptations, I believe it there, objectively is there bad. is objectively <laughs> good and evil. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, there yeah, is yeah, yeah. like That's a good God, point. Satan. There is wh whatever you want to call it. There is even like a, a materialist atheist could make an argument, could try to make an argument for good, bad, objectively. Correct. Where, whereas like cookie versus apple, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes cookie's good, sometimes apple's good. Depends on the context. Depends on who you are. Depends That's on what such you struggle a good point. with. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so like I, I don't, cheating I don't on like your partner for... is objectively bad. Yes. Right. It's objectively yes. bad even. And yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. That makes total sense. Yeah. 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 But the, yeah, naming the, you know, the, the, 
one who gives in to temptations. Um, th- th- there's, I'm, I'm now blending chapter one and chapter two a little bit, but she talks about, uh, you know, like research that shows even small amounts of sleep deprivation have a massive negative impact on willpower and, uh, a very small amount of, of increased sleep. So if you're sleep deprived just one night, you're more likely to do X, Y, Z, quote unquote, bad things, but just a 20 minute nap will give you like multiple hours of a, a refilled tank of willpower. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Man, naps. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of obvious stuff, but it, it's, I'm really enjoying it so far. I was looking at my watch the other day, just going through it because it's a relatively new watch and uh, it was, I was looking through all my health stats and I was looking so at a Rolex. You get a Rolex? Uh, shut. No, I didn't get a <laughs> Rolex. You, you got a Rolex. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the best. When did no, you learn? It's... When did you learn that? Like third grade? Yeah, probably third, second or third grade. And yeah, whatever like, they someone say, like, says something, you're an idiot. You just say it you're right an back idiot. To... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but no, it's a. Uh... No, what you kind of lent me it? this. You you gifted me this watch, this Garmin watch. You gifted me this uh, Phoenix Seven. Um, no, you gifted. No, you didn't me. actually. Uh, no, but this is a new one, and I was joking because you oh. said I have a Rolex. Anyway, uh. that anyway. No, I got a Garmin. Um, Did your humor just go way over my head? It was probably just a bad joke. It was okay. just a bad. Joke. Okay, but it one of the subsets under sleep was naps, and I was just like, mm. oh man. It just in my mind, I was like, who's taking naps? It's like, <laughs> who has Dude, the time for naps, bro? When, when you're um, REM deprived, there's a lot of good research around biphasic sleep schedules for people who can't get enough sleep in one straight shot during the night for whatever reason. But getting, uh, if you're deprived of REM, you, when you take a nap, you fall immediately into REM sleep. And so even like, I don't know if it's 15 or 12 or 18, somewhere in that minutes of a nap is really beneficial. Bro, I'm not hating on on the benefits. I'm just saying at, at my current season of life, in no, there is no world in which I'm taking a nap. Even like if I, let's say I was away on a business trip. I'm going to challenge you on this one because There's you no work out every day. You're getting workouts and those are way longer than 15 minutes. Correct. But I'm not prioritizing a nap over a workout. There's no world in which I'm doing that unless I'm like haven't slept for four days. I don't know. You know, it's funny. It's actually an interesting talk. Like I would probably rather go on a walk than take a nap at this point in my life. Like I feel like I would feel better getting outside, being in the sun, moving fresh air than staying in the house and taking a 20 minute nap. Then you're probably not sleep deprived. That's a real, it's a real possibility. Yeah. I, I liked in the book, the the conversations of the people who had issues where like those parts of their brain were literally gone. Like, uh, like the Mm. guy who went, he had that issue at the railroad tracks and the, the pipe went through his face and through his skull and literally gray matter was on the ground. And then the doctors, like they physically stitched him up and physically fixed him. But that part of his brain, the prefrontal cortex was, so severely damaged that he like didn't have any willpower anymore and it was just like it was wild how that negatively affected him and also the woman and it took away her her instincts what what did it take away from her it took away her natural instincts of fear and disgust disgust yes and so she started making passes at her family (laughs) members (laughs) like like like, like sexual advances yeah (laughs) just just like really crazy really really crazy and it's sort of you know you need both you need both you know what's interesting is i know someone who experienced this not no way none of the sexual stuff but uh personality change from a physical brain trauma yeah Like an an older person who um, had a really bad – got hit by a car in a parking lot. She was walking and uh, yeah, really bad. Her personality changed like overnight from it. Really? And 
And some of the big differences were the ones described in the book where she used to be very health conscious, very like for her whole life. She was making really good food choices and it, it was almost one of her main things. And afterwards, after the accident, she had like not toddler like instincts, but like young child like instincts in terms really? of fruit snacks or like eating like, you know, cereal just w with her hands type like a real personality change oh, yeah that's devastating is she able yeah. to function on her own or no i mean at this point i i believe she's over 90 years old now so she oh okay, okay. has has some help um has some help but, that's but crazy yeah her personality changed from the accident wow i'm sorry bro yeah, it's 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 very sad. Fruit snacks are super good, though. To be fair, yeah, I'm. I almost am not painting it. Like, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I was trying to make <laughs> a humor in a terrible situation. I apologize. <laughs> I agree. I think fruit snacks are an underrated. Back to the beginning of the episode, I love fruit snacks. Yeah, and one of the reasons to wrap the vice thing. One of the reasons I like, um, uh. Mo dessert in moderation as an acceptable and like the best vice is because there's also benefit to it. Like there's very little benefit to heroin. There's very little benefit to alcohol. <laughs> like I'm, I'm sure you can make arguments, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But like fruit snacks are actually giving you they're give well more than yes, and they're just giving you energy to live. Mm -hmm. We need calories mm -hmm. to live, yeah. so. Are they the best choice? A sweet potato, a hundred grams of sweet potato versus fruits. Like, is it the best thing you can eat? No, but there are benefits. Man, I remember being in elementary school and fruit snacks, I think they're like 50 cents or something. They had this little snack cart in the in the cafeteria. And I would just get one pack occasionally. And I don't know, they were small packs. But I would just eat one pack and I was like totally satisfied. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is great. And I would savor each bite and just they were full of flavor. And now I see these, like if I, I could eat an entire box and still probably not be satisfied of fruit snack. You know what I mean? It's just like when you're a kid, there's something about it. And then as, I don't know, at least for me, if I had one of those little packages now, I could inhale the whole thing in half a second. It's like when I watch my daughter, she'll have a munchkin. We go to Dunkin' Donuts once, like maybe once a month, once a couple times a month. Mm -hmm. She could literally not even finish a munchkin and, mm -hmm. and just be totally happy. A munchkin. It's like 70 calories. Like a little. 70 yeah. cal it's a little. Yeah. And she could have like a couple nibbles, be like, I'm good. It's incredible. I, I believe that that is the absence of chronic stress on a child compared to an adult like being mm. in a because for you right now or for me that isn't uh it isn't a function of being so lean or like trying to over restrict calories which makes you when you do enjoy something you want a lot of it it's it's more wanting the the i mean part of it's serving size too right you're bigger now than you were when you were in sixth grade seventh grade a little so. barely <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> That's not true. <laughs> so part of it's that. Uh, you know what I'm sick of, dude? I'm sick of the supplement space. Bro, go off. <laughs> I'm seeing so much uh, like junk, right? I'm seeing so many different brands going for this like our protein powder is Nutter Butter. Our protein powder is Oreo. Our protein powder is this like sexification of the, <laughs> the far end of IIFYM that I thought had peaked years ago, but it's almost like supplement no. companies and corporations. But remember the peak of like, like IFYM food porn where it's just all this yeah. artificial sweetener, all this yeah, these yeah, Instagram yeah. accounts have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers. And people are like, oh my gosh, it says 40 grams of protein and like very little carb fat. And it's, you know, not even real food at the end of the day, right? It's mm -hmm. sauces and syrups and whippings and fluffs and da, da, da. Like, and yes, there's a place for it in moderation. If you're trying to lose fat and you want some sweet, some enjoyment, some satiety, but 
seen the number of supplement companies that are trying to come out with all these glamorous like product. Um, and I don't, I don't want to name any, na- it literally feels like most of them. Uh, it's just like, can we just get back to eating normal food? Like, yeah, just food. Eat your protein, drink your water, you know, eat some fiber, track if you're trying to lose fat or build muscle or have more dialed goals, but like eat food, eat vegetables, eat fruit, go for a walk, get enough sleep. Like this, because the other side of it isn't just on the supply side, meaning the supplement companies are making these products. It's also the rising number of people, or maybe it was always a desire from people to have this magic pill that's going to give them perfect gut health, that's going to give them the best microbiome, that's going to give them all of their daily vitamin and mineral needs and just one little wheatgrass shot first thing in the morning. It's going to give them, you know, the electrolytes to hydrate their body properly because your hydration's broken. All this, like, it just seems like it's getting more out of control than it was before. And even though I know there there is some value to some of the supplements, like borderline a, a minority of the supplements now, I almost want a contrarian go the other way and just be like, they're so far down on the list of importance, uh, especially relative to how much attention they get. Dude, I completely agree with you. I think it was maybe a month ago, within the last two months at most, I made a, a big post about how upset I was at how many people asked me about creatine. Mm. Because when I do a Q&A, not since I made this post, but when I do a Q&A, <laughs> The most common question I've gotten for years is about creatine. Even now, when I still do Q&A, I still get them from new followers or people who missed the post, but it's about creatine. Should I take creatine? Is creatine good for women over 40? Is creatine good for a high school kid? Creatine, 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 creatine. Everything is about creatine. How much creatine should I take? How long is the loading phase? What type of creatine? And I was like, I got so mad. I ended up making a really like angry post at like 10 p.m. My wife was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm making this fucking post. I'm just so angry. Because that's usually when I do my Q&As at night. And um, I was like, listen, yeah, creatine is one of the actual few supplements that legitimately has benefits. Mm-hmm. It's one of the few that actually makes sense to promote. It, it mm-hmm. is one of the few. But I know for a fact the vast majority of you asking me about creatine haven't worked out consistently for three years. You haven't had a salad in the last three fucking years, you never hit your protein intake. You like you don't go get your steps in. You are up until four in the morning scrolling, and then like you're like you're drinking mm. alcohol four or five times a week. Like mm. you aren't being consistent with anything, and you're asking me about creatine. Mm-hmm. Like the, you should only even think about it if you've been consistent with strength training, consistent with cardio, consistent with nutrition, consistent with sleep for at least three years. And it should not be the most common question in my Q&A, not even remotely close. And, it's, and, and that's one of the good supplements. Like that's one of the supplements that actually makes sense. Never mind the shit supplements. Yeah. Preach. We are, we are fully aligned on this one. I made a big, you see my post on electrolytes yesterday? I don't think so. People got really mad because is it's another big one. Which and actually, by the way, another supplement that actually can make sense. I would say uh, it makes sense less than creatine does with a smaller portion of the population. But basically, I'm seeing all these motherfuckers promoting their LMNT Everywhere. electrolytes. Everyone, everyone's doing it. Yeah, and uh, and I made this whole post. I was like, Do you realize number one? that they can actually be very dangerous if you don't need them. People are hospitalized regularly for them. I was like, there are some people who it makes sense for. If you are an endurance athlete, it can make sense for you if you're training and sweating a lot. If you work in manual labor, especially if you're working out in the heat and sweating a lot, it can make sense. Uh, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, it can make sense. It might actually, it could potentially make sense for people on GLP ones. Uh, and there are other potential, like if you have POTS, some other uh, medical medical issues, there it might make sense. But 
if you're a recreational lifter and you're lifting in an air conditioned gym three to four times a week for 30 to 60 minutes and you're barely sweating, you have no reason to be taking these things. And it actually it can cause cardiac issues. It can cause real fucking problems. And I made that post and a number of nurses and doctors were comment and I pinned their comments being like, thank you for saying this. We're seeing an increased number of people who are being hospitalized for it. Da 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 da. It was like, it's just, it's insane. And so many people are pushing it. Preach. People don't realize that they're consuming something that they already are getting in their foods and and they don't know how much they're getting in their foods, nor do they know how much they're getting in these packets, nor do they know what they should be targeting on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine uh, – it depends on the product, right? Because the sodium to potassium ratio is different depending on uh, – on uh, what electrolyte you're taking, but I would imagine there's more overconsumption. I mean, obviously you can overconsume potassium and there's downsides to that too, but um, overconsumption of sodium doesn't seem difficult if you're eating like a decent amount of processed foods, if you enjoy your, like if you're salting your foods and then you layer on top of that, having electrolytes and you're not sweating very much. And by the way, my wife uses electrolytes because she has really low blood pressure. I use electrolytes once in a blue moon when I need to, if I'm playing yeah. 36 holes of golf and it's 90 yep. degrees outside and yep. I don't have an opportunity to have a salty meal at the turn and I only am consuming potassium. I've had two bananas for snacks. I'm like, okay, I want to get some sodium in me. Great. I'll put a sodium packet in a 24 ounce thing of water or an electrolyte packet and get 500 migs right there or get 750 right there. But it, it, Few and far between. You don't just take it first thing in the morning because adenosine system and da 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 and don't drink caffeine, but have a lot of electrolytes. And then have these people being like, "What if you're regularly hungover?" Like, then you've got other fucking problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if if you're regularly, you've got other fucking problems outside of electrolytes. All right, dear lord. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at at the end of the day not just this electrolyte thing, but kind of back to your creatine, um, the, the high levels of interest and questions about creatine and hyper-focus on supplements in general from the Gen Pop. It doesn't seem like it's much different than the instinct that's always been there for a shortcut for if I can take this instead of doing this and it's going to get me a positive result, any kind of like magic pill belief where if I can get results by taking this thing instead of doing the hard thing, great, I'm going to do it. The problem is that that quick fix basically doesn't exist in any area of life. Mm -hmm. Correct. What, what, this might be interesting, a little present day update. What, if any supplements do you take right now regularly? Regularly? in the, Well, it's sort of a, you caught me at a real crossroads. Because in this moment and for the last few months, nothing. Like I'm doing two daily walks out in the sun uh, when the UV index is three or below. So I haven't been putting sunscreen on. Um, and so I, had, so I haven't been taking vitamin D. I've been eating salmon at least three times a week, usually more. So I, I haven't been having fish oil. Um I don't take any supplements. And I mean, if we're counting protein powder, I'll have that yeah. a couple of times a week after I work out. Um, but uh, I actually just partnered with Merrick Health. So I'm in the process of getting all of those figured out. So I would imagine by the end of the month, I'll start like they took my blood work. They figured out what I'm like what they want me to work on. So I will be taking stuff with it by the end of the month, but for the last few months, nothing. Cool. What are you taking? Uh, protein powder, but yet less than I was previously taking. I would say maybe 150 grams per week of protein via protein powder. So 25 yeah, grams like a day, 20 to 25 day, like grams what? a day. Yeah, yeah that's not... That's yeah. Um, well, and there's nothing wrong with taking more than that either. Correct. By the way, I think f 50 grams of protein powder per day, I think is a really solid way to get convenient, tasty, Easy. like good, yeah, good way to hit your protein targets. I'm, I'm fully on board with that. Uh, creatine 
inconsistently, but when I remember to throw it in my protein shake, I'll throw it in there. How many times a week do you remember, do you think? Three to four. You think you're saturated or no, nearly saturated? I don't think I'm, I, don't think, no. I don't think I'm saturated. No. Is it more like a mental thing? No, I think it's a better than nothing thing. I think it's a, I'm not doing training volume where I need to be saturated. Um, but it's like a, yeah, 10, 10 to 12 grams a week, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and vitamin D when I remember. And then if I start feeling sick at any point in time, I'll high dose vitamin C for a couple of mm. days, which has yeah, been yeah. a very effective too. strategy in my in my 2.5 year streak of not getting actually sick, knock on wood. I don't know why that's not more spoken about. I actually made a post about that within the last year. Like vitamin C is one of the another one of the very few supplements that actually has legitimate research behind it to help pr- like you start feeling yourself get sick, super dose some vitamin C. I do that. Mm-hmm. My wife and I both do that. And like very similarly, like, thank God we we rarely ever get sick. And oftentimes, as soon as we start to feel it, we take it and it will, I would imagine, reduce the duration. Because I, if I used to get sick, it would last for sometimes five days, seven days. And now it might be an overnight thing. It's, and there's real research around vitamin C. I feel like it should really be talked about more. I do too. Duration. Uh intensity likelihood likelihood of getting sick and intensity of how yeah. sick or not sick you get and yeah because it's not binary right like you can kind of start to feel a couple of cold symptoms or whatever and they're gone in in 24 to 48 hours or you start to feel that and then you actually end up getting sick mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what how much vitamin c do you take when you do that i just take one uh emergency packet at night and that's it. And I, I mean, I think I get a fair amount of vitamin C throughout the day, like probably more than the average. Just I, I eat a fair amount of fruit. Um, yeah. So a, a, a gram, a thousand milligrams yeah. of, of vitamin C. I'll actually do one to two emergencies per day when I'm starting to feel sick. Um, and with that uh, vitamin C capsule or whatever, a, a one mm. gram vitamin C capsule. So I'll, I'll go for a gram three times per day spread out drinking lots of water. Oh, wow. Does your pee get like neon? No. I haven't had neon pee since, I don't know, since I took some random multivitamin <laughs> eight to 10 years ago. <laughs> it's like, what is in this thing? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Well, so we'll dive into questions. I have one last random kind of thought. It's so hard to do. And you definitely can't relate to this right now with a two-year-old and a three- how old Slim Jim? Uh, four weeks yesterday, I think. Yeah, yeah, four week and a two year old. But if possible, and if anyone ever wants to try this, only having caffeine before your workouts and at no other point in time. So, yeah, like on days luck. you don't work out, <laughs> it's been a real. Uh, first of all, the benefits are tremendous in terms of training enjoyment and training and like my workouts the secondary benefit is because caffeine is a stimulant on a rest day where you know you're recovering from your workout if you are maximizing the amount of parasympathetic nervous system activity or the amount of rest and digest the amount of chill out not having a stimulant um, has been extremely beneficial for me in terms of digestion, in terms of how my body has felt on those days, any any knots, any like little aches or pains have been minimized for whatever reason. Uh, and the third benefit that I've noticed is the opportunity to build willpower by doing difficult things without caffeine. Mm. And so for what? 13, 12 years. For 12 years, I would say 99.9% of times when I've worked, I've been caffeinated. I wake up and have coffee immediately, basically every day of the last 12 years. If I don't do that, it's obviously more difficult to do any kind of work, but pushing through that has been uh, a fun challenge, we'll say. I like that. Yeah. You mentioned it the other day. And I think it sounded like the one of the biggest ones for you is like the digestion side of it, how it improves your digestion. And my digestion's really good. And so 
off of that baseline, I didn't know I had room for improvement. That's amazing. Some something to consider. I'm not definitely not pushing this on you right now, two young kids, but you're just trying to make my life even harder. No. <laughs> this is this one's for the listeners. Is if anyone way trying to get me to, to anyone, not have caffeine. Just like all right, no, everyone listening. For anyone you listening. Should. <laughs> there's so ma- there's so many benefits to caffeine. There's so many benefits. But for me personally, as someone who has, I've decreased the amount of caffeine I've had over the years. I used to be in the 400 to 500 milligrams a day range. And now I, over the last several years, I've been in the 100 to 300 milligrams a day range. But, oh, and sleep quality is the other thing that's been wild on no caffeine days, obviously. Man, you're really just rubbing it in right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> oh. Sleep quality has been good. (laughs) How's your sleep quality? Uh, It's it's really meant to be for anyone who feels pulled to the idea of – because caffeine is the most common, most widely abused vice that we have. Hmm. And and there are so many benefits, physiological and psychological, but it could be interesting for anyone who's – interested in the idea bro did did we talk about last time the reverse hyper did we talk about that on the podcast no let's let's talk about it but if i wanted you to do something do you you think i I would covertly be like hey audience you can try this if you're interested as a way to try to get you to do it i'd be like jordan you need to do this similar to when i I said buy willpower instinct and start listening we're gonna pot about it in two days like okay Bro, the reverse. We, we didn't talk about this last time. I don't think we talked about uh, the delivery of your. I I don't remember, but the scout got delivered. It got delivered, man. It it feels amazing when I when I used to use the reverse hypers when I was training at Westside. Mm-hmm. I was young. I was twenty one, and I hadn't done any damage to my spine with insanely heavy lifting at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and so mm-hmm. I would do the reverse hyper, and I'd be like. Yeah, it feels fine. Like, I don't really notice anything though. And now that I've got this bulging disc, I get on the reverse hyper and the immediate relief that I feel with the traction on my spine is unlike anything else I've ever felt with any other exercise I've ever done, ever. It is- That's like amazing. I- immediate range of motion increases, immediate relief. Uh, and it is more acute. Like, it doesn't last all day, but like, it will- for hours immediately and for a few hours, like have a, a certain level of relief. And then I think long-term it will help with the healing more quickly. The physical therapist came yesterday and she's like, wow, like much better, much, much, much better already. And I've been doing the exercises she gave, so I'm sure it's all contributing, but man, it's yeah, the reverse hyper. And it was only like 350, 400 bucks, like best piece of equipment, best like 400 bucks I ever spent. Wild. We'll link it in the show notes. No affiliate link. None of yeah, that. No affiliate none of link. That garbage here. I don't even but think if they you're, have if you're interested, yeah. Um. Do Do you feel the benefit immediately after a set, or I mean, you probably do, but and or do you feel good? Does your back feel good during the set? And if Both. so, is is there any part of the range of motion where you get even more relief where you're like, oh, it feels really good at this part of each rep. At the at the halfway point of the rep when my feet are the most underneath me as I'm getting the, the traction on my spine. So it's when I'm in, in lumbar flexion as the weights are pulling my feet away from me, like uh, uh, with that momentum as my legs are going underneath the table. Oh, like I feel the space in my spine opening up. When you are in the the most stretch position of each rep. Correct. Correct. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's Sweet. just, oh my gosh, it's incredible. Then I get off and like I can do a toe touch, no problem, zero pain. It's just, yeah. So very, very happy. And then I can do that and I go into my regular workouts, no problem. Like, yeah. But dude, I, I deadlifted, I, you probably didn't see this. Someone asked me the other day, they were like, do you think all the mobility work is causing you to lose your strength? And so this is at 9 p.m. or it was 9, 12 p.m. I had just put my girls down for bed. Hang on. You, hang on. Yeah. You got a bulging disc that's less than a month old. You got a comment about your deadlift. And at, at right before bed, you went in your garage and started heavy deadlifting? Yeah. <laughs> you're you're yeah. different, bro. You're on a different I, level. 
I was like, I was like, you think this? I'm losing strength. I was like, this absolutely not. So I slapped on three fifteen, no mm. warm ups. Did, you didn't. I, oh, let me show you this. No, I, I, I believe. I fully believe you, and I'm not surprised at all you're on just the like, physical you're side. So stupid. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm Hold baffled on. that like with all of the low back stuff over the last six weeks or whatever it's been yeah my physical therapist saw it, saw it. she was like what are you doing <laughs> what are you doing that's a wonderful <laughs> wonderful question hold on here we go i'm gonna show you this is no warm-up 9 p.m boom no problem i'm dude i'm not impressed i'm pissed at you um, <laughs> um i'm disappointed <laughs> um, <laughs> It's pretty good, though. Good. It, I'm not surprised at that, though, because uh, you built a, an incredible strength base and you continue to strength train. And so I don't think that uh, focusing on flexibility for a period of time is – well, I know that focusing on flexibility for a period of time isn't going to make you weak. I'm just surprised that given the nature of your injury and – Yeah. Hey, at least you didn't like – conventional and put even more oh stress yeah that would have been stupid like, that would have been stupid no moderate sumo good job i was Jordan. pretty happy with it though thanks man i, I, I know <laughs> <laughs> what did the person say they were like that's awesome i was like yeah yeah, yeah you're right it is that is awesome <laughs> that's pretty sick <laughs> dude you, I, I mean i'm glad i only went 315 part of me wanted to go 405 <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, you know what? I think 315 is is plenty. If you would have gone 405 and re-tweaked your back. Oh my God. I would, yeah. That would have been so disheartening. It would have been terrible. I, I might have ripped a hamstring off the bone. Because like, I was like, 315 is something where I think I could do it pretty easily, which I did. 415, like 405 would have been something where like, I probably would have really grinded through it. And it would have mm-hmm. been like one of those shaking lifts where like, got the vein going on my head and I'm like Ugh! and like that wouldn't look as good <laughs> yeah it's almost for for public perception it's almost like like if if your average follower it's like what difference does your average follower see in three plates versus four plates and nothing and then yeah and then with like if one of them looks easy and one of them's a little grindier it's almost <laughs> like 315 easy is more impressive than a grindy 405 a hundred percent yeah yeah it's so true all right, I'll give you one more random thing, and then we're going to do a true rapid fire where we answer five questions in 10 words or less each. Okay, I like that. I've noticed this phenomenon where going for walks in my neighborhood, and other, it's it's beautiful here in Minnesota this time of year, uh, people under the age of 40 don't say hi. And not saying hi when you're in a big city, not saying hi when you're... I don't know. It probably varies based on where you are in the world. Definitely does. But when you're walking by someone on a sidewalk and there's no one else around and you see each other coming from a distance, it seems common courtesy, like normal socialization to at least smile and nod or like just an acknowledgement or a hey Mm -hmm. or a hey, how's it going? People... 40 to 45 plus, especially in their 50s and 60s and, and older. I'm They'll talking like we, we might have real conversations. Oh, yeah. But, but men and women, 40 and under, they're, it's like 90 plus percent of the time, they'll strive to avoid eye contact. And sometimes they'll have sunglasses or like a hat pulled down or looking away or pretending not Are to Are they know. looking at their phone? No, not usually. No, they're just wow. avoiding looking at me and maybe it's a me thing i don't know but i've noticed it's distinctly uh separated by age and i have some theories um i'm just curious what you think of that i mean it's cra- i in minnesota i would have expected it to be the exact opposite i would have expected you to be like people all ages everyone is just being like hey how are you i i <laughs> <laughs> I never would have expected, especially that that breath. I could see between like twenty two to twenty eight, maybe doing that. But like, mm-hmm. I never would have expected like all the way up to forty. And mm-hmm. here, at least where we are, it's the complete opposite. I can't walk. I can't walk 
past two houses without someone opening up their window being like, hey, how's it going? Like, I can't, people are mm-hmm. always, hey, come on in. Like, it's everyone here, whether it doesn't matter if like 17 year old, this six year old boy named Axel is like, he's riding his bike and he's got his like little horns on his helmet. And every time he sees me, he starts going really, really, really fast. I'm like, what's up, Axel? And his mom is out there and she's talking to us. And hey, can we come pet your dog? Maybe, I Actually, a dog probably biases it because everyone likes to pet a dog but yeah yeah it's very odd like it, i i never would have expected that from minnesota yeah new york would make sense to me chicago when you're but like even like downtown minneapolis i wouldn't expect it yeah. but when you're yeah, when yeah. you're in a suburban neighborhood where there's no one you know you're the only two people who are out within yeah. visibility at that time and you're coming up to each other it's just it's bizarre and you, I, are you, I think are you carrying your water bottle when you're walking? <laughs> no, I'm not. You're not. All right. You the think that would deter people is, from it? <laughs> well, just as an as someone who's walked with you before. No, like, you don't know how I walk in my neighborhood. These aren't like <laughs> these are like these you are, walk trust intimidatingly. Me, when I see people, I like ease up. I smile, I'm looking at them, I'm waiting for them to look at me and I'm going to acknowledge my neighbor. And I, bro, I truly, and this is not, this is not a shot at prescription medication because I know it can be very important and even life-saving for people in certain times in their lives. I think that we have an over-medicated generation. A hundred percent. And I think that's contributing to antisocial behavior. I yeah. think that that, you think that like, what may- Adderall are you talking about? Uh, maybe SSRIs. I, I don't even know. I don't even know oh, which okay. ones. I just see like weird behavior. Yeah, it, it could be some type of amphetamine, Ritalin type stuff for people who are doing excess amounts of computer work. I, I don't know, but that coupled with uh, living online more than living in person right? 1990s, we were literally living in person. 2024, most people are spending, who knows, four, five, six, seven plus hours a day of screen time. Um, so Easy. if which of the, yeah, 10, I don't know what's driving more antisocial behavior, but I'm seeing it and I'm seeing it up to, like you said, you'd expect it more 22 to 28. I'm seeing it up to a, a higher age. That's so odd. Yeah, my brain is just seeing you walk the way I know you walk, which is like you you walk like I I know you probably walk differently in your town and you're like much more relaxed, Bro, maybe you're, a stroller. You're, you're, th- you're thinking of I'm thinking you in New York thinking, City. You're thinking OTR 2016, 2017 yeah. on 500 yeah. mg of caffeine, trying to get from 10th Street to 28th <laughs> Street as fast as I can and just motoring. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm literally out for a stroll, like <laughs> and you were smelling also the huge. flowers. You were like 200 pounds and like 6% body. Like you were intimidating. Dude, I'm hu- hang on, hang on. First of all, I was never 200 pounds, 6% body fat at my height. I don't even think that's achievable, Natty. I was 193, 194, I think at the peak. And I was probably 14 to 15% no, body fat. 14. Yes. No. Dude, I bulked from like 170 to 195 or whatever it was. Definitely. And by the way, I'm yeah. big now. What are you talking about? <laughs> How much do you weigh right now? 182. Oh, all wow. muscle. Wow. Okay. Not all muscle. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what 182, that is. 182, 12%. Uh, I wonder if people are more socially awkward. I don't, maybe they're just like, you know what? It's you know funny. What's you're, you know what? I don't even what? want to talk about this anymore. Jordan tried to make it a me thing. Like people don't want to say hi to me. I, let's do a challenge. It was a joke. To, I was, no, jo- dear Lord. I'm not, I'm not joking. I'm going to fly you to Minnesota and I'm going to make you walk around my neighborhood and I'm just going to okay. observe. I Can't guarantee wait. you people are going to say hi to me. I guarantee you this demo is not. In fact, they're going to cross the street. You. They're going to see they're going to see you coming and they're going to be like <laughs> cross the street. People are going to you're going to have 34-year-olds running out of their house to have a conversation with me. They're Watch. literally going to be like this guy with his cauliflower <laughs> ear and his tattoo sleeve, like this guy's about to choke me out. What who is that? Is that Gordon Ryan? Get me out of here. Oh. That's what they're going to be doing. All right, rapid fire, (laughs) rapid fire. Poor mommy. This has been a good episode. If you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe YouTube, like YouTube, leave us a comment, a five-star review. We, We need it. 
We're, this, we we're not gonna it. we're not gonna beg for, we're not gonna get on our knees, but like please now's the time to help us out. If you've enjoyed the podcast, now's the time. Thank you. Urka seven said, What difference does it make if you do or don't eat protein right after a workout? If you have eaten protein within a few hours before your strength training, it doesn't matter. You can have protein again a half hour, an hour, two hours after your lift, just getting 30 to 40 grams, three to four times a day a day is going to maximize the benefit. If you're fasted and you haven't consumed any protein before your strength training, there is benefit to getting protein immediately after, regardless of what the meme accounts and the fitfluencers will say about rushing to the locker room to slam your protein shake. If you're fasted, if you're strength training fasted and you haven't had protein in 15 hours at your post-workout, let's say your last protein was 8 p.m., you work out the next morning, you're done with your workout at 9, 10 a.m., yeah, have protein immediately after your workout. Part of me misses the days of believing that you really needed to get your protein in so fast. Like you I do remember if being you train in high fasted. school. <laughs> I'm going the other way. You do. <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're fasted, here let's do this. Let's do this. Anyone who wants to challenge me on this, who's actually natty, <laughs> all right? None of you fake natties. I I want you. I want you to lift at 7 a.m. And then don't eat any protein. Don't eat any protein, not a gram, <laughs> until 9 p.m. Wait 14 hours and do that for the next decade. And let me know how those gains are. <laughs> All right? Yes, the anabolic window is overblown, of course. But if you haven't had protein in a while, getting pro. I'll bring Alan Air. Well, I don't. <laughs> Alan and I aren't like that. But <laughs> I would love to have Alan on here. To be like, I agree he'll with come Mike. On. Get getting. I know he'll come on. He loves you, but <laughs> having, having him on. <laughs> or I don't know. Man, I don't know if this needs to get edited in some way. I'm really feeling no, it. It's but great. He would agree with me that having one dose of protein of 150 grams at nine o'clock at night with a 7 a.m. workout as your daily routine is less beneficial than having 40 grams of protein at 9 a.m., 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and 9 p.m. <laughs> So much for rapid fire. What are, what are we doing? We. <laughs> Next question. Did Gary V influence your social media strategy? When I posted yes, he did not influence the one that just doesn't post for six years. That wasn't his doing. Has it been six years? You know, since I was regularly making content? Yeah, probably 2018. Wow. Man, that's crazy. 2018 was six years ago. Did he influence your social media strategy? Yeah, for sure. Um, damn, that Amazon Prime driver is whipping around a cul-de-sac. Um, yeah, of course. Of course. For I anyone mean, I, for anyone on audio, over the last 10 minutes, Jordan has looked out of his window in a concerned <laughs> fashion about six times in the last 10 minutes. I always forget that people are watching on YouTube. So when you just said for anyone on audio, I didn't even realize that people were watching me look out the window just for the last 10 minutes. There was someone who parked in a blue car right outside my house. I was like, what the fuck? Like, I always get on high alert. I'm like, who is I that? know. Oh, I know you get on high alert. <laughs> and they're coming up to my door. I don't know. I don't like it when these unmarked cars start coming up to my door. And like, because it's different now with people delivering stuff. It's not always in a delivery vehicle. People just like bring shit in their own car. I'm like, what are you doing? But uh, yeah, I mean, the only reason I posted three times a day every day was because Gary told me to do that when you and I were both with him in Florida. But um, I will say now it's different. It's a different strategy than what he said then. Like what worked then isn't what works now. Uh, it's actually, it's a very different social media world now in terms of it was, num I mean, your a number of followers mattered way more back then. How many followers you had essentially dictated how many people saw your content. And now your number of followers plays a much smaller role in how many people see your content. Now it's much more about how good is actually, I shouldn't say good. I don't think good is the right word. How um, captivating, I would say, how captivating is your content now is what is the largest driver of how many people will see your content. Uh, each individual piece, it, it puts way more value on 
each individual piece of content as a standalone piece of content. Whereas before it was, how many followers do you have? Which is like, I personally like the old way better. (laughs) 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 But um, yeah, it's, it's very different. And I would imagine now Gary probably has changed the the perspective of instead of posting three times a day every day it's much more about spending more time on one individual piece of content but uh yeah i mean i realistically i you know in the same way that alan aragon martin burke and lyle mcdonald i think in the same way they've influenced basically everyone in the science-based fitness world without them without even people who don't even realize they've been influenced by them Mm -hmm. i would imagine most people if not all people posting on social media regularly have been influenced by Gary, even if they haven't realized they've been influenced by, by Gary. That's, that's a bigger compliment to Gary than I think maybe anyone listening realizes because Lyle, Martin, and Alan, you could borderline say created the evidence-based, yes. especially around nutrition, the yes. evidence-based fitness space. Correct. Yeah. All right. Last rapid fire. Is it okay to lift heavy on the first set and then lighter? Uh, Jordan did that with 315 and thankfully didn't blow his back <laughs> out. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it depends, but you love no. this. You love RPT. So I don't, I don't think what they're describing is RPT because if you're talking about the actual first set of an exercise, no, no it's not sets. okay because just you need. Sets. Did it say work sets? No, it didn't say work sets. It said it just said first set. Yeah, it's it a reverse pyramid training strategy is definitely reasonable where you decrease the weight you're using from working set to working set while simultaneously increasing the number of reps you're doing from working set to working set to keep intensity high or to keep your RPE high on each of those sets. Uh, Yes, it's absolutely a reasonable strategy, assuming you are doing a proper warm up before. So, yeah, uh, at least a few lighter weight sets of that movement to get warm before that heavy set. Great. Thank you, everyone, for listening. This was awesome. Make sure you leave, please, please leave a five star review, iTunes, Spotify. Like this on YouTube, subscribe to YouTube, subscribe to our podcast, get our notifications. If you're a coach and you want to build your business, you want to help more people, you want to be a better coach, you want to help people improve their health, their fitness, improve their lives, you want to improve your life, the life of your family, become have a build a sustainable online coaching business, you can apply to join the online fitness business mentorship. Link is in the show notes. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. We'll talk to you soon. See you next Tuesday. <laughs>